now, my dudes. Thanks for hanging out and drinking with two dudes and a mic. I'm your host, Mike, and as always, I'm sitting across from my favorite dude, Gus. What do we have going on today? We've got an interesting show, doing uh, remote again, in the uh, current circumstances. But we got a great guest in uh, remote studio today. We do. Joining us from her studio, we have singer-songwriter Chrissy Cochran, who released her album Heirloom last February, and is preparing for an upcoming live charity event, Home for the Holidays, airing December 18th. Chrissy Cochran, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me. No problem. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for hanging out with us. We uh, we do shots right off the beginning of the show, but I know <sighs> I know you have wine, so you'll just have to cheers with some wine. Um, I like it. We are going to be drinking some grapefruit vodka. Gus, this is weird. Ooh. I can't see you. <laughs> I mean, just Hold gotta... it off to the side there, my man. There you go. There we go, yeah. The other side. That way <laughs> I can see it. Okay, there we go. <laughs> all right. So everybody listening, guys, girls, all the dudes, here we go. Cheers. 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 And I'm actually uh, switching it up, so I'm going to be drinking uh, vodka water. I'm just going with the... Vodka uh, water. Yeah, normally we do beer, but I don't know. I feel like I need to hydrate more today. Hmm. Yeah. Fair enough. Do you ever do vodka water? Is there any vodka at all? Mm, not really. We mostly buy gin and oh, whiskey. Gin. Whiskey, I can get behind whiskey. Gin, I don't know. The the pine taste is just a little bit too much for me. Gin yeah, tastes like gin pine? Yeah, gin and tonic. It's, yeah, yeah. It's It's got a bunch of different herbs in it, and it definitely has a piney kind of taste. I don't get that from it. I don't know. I, like, it's been a while since I've had gin, but... Yeah, I know I don't I don't like it as much as uh, other clear liquors, but it is what it is. Gets the job done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that is true. That Anything with alcohol gets the job done. And you're, what are you drinking? Yeah. You got red wine over there? I have red wine. It's a Peely Island wine. My parents bought us a case of wine for Christmas, and it came early. So Is there going to be any left? Open. Um, I think there may I don't know, actually. No promises. Christmas is still a long way away. <laughs> yeah, that is true. Especially if we're uh, if we're all going to be sitting at home for a little while. You've been sitting at home for, for the most of the year, right? You just had a new baby, too? Uh, well, she's two, so not terribly new. It's definitely hard to keep a toddler inside Handful, though. all the time. Oh, God, yeah. 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 I miss being able to like bring her, you know, to new places and have new experiences and interact with people. Like she doesn't have any friends who are kids. Like she only knows our friends. So I feel like if not for like if the pandemic hadn't happened, I feel like, you know, she'd be having like play dates with other kids from like, you know, there's like a an early year center in our neighborhood that we used to go to. Right. So yeah, I feel bad. Yeah, she has a, no friends. It's kind of a weird uh like a weird environment to be born into, I guess, right? To try and grow up in. It's it's different. Yeah. It's different than our childhood, that's for sure. Yeah, especially because, you know, that she formerly had times that were much more social. So it, it was definitely an adjustment to go into, now you're only seeing like these same, you know, your parents and maybe like a set of grandparents once a month, maybe. So the same four people for an entire year. Is... Yeah. yeah, yeah, but who cares? You know, like you get to be at home with her, so it's not bad. Exactly. Is yeah, it hard, no, it's... Is it hard to do like recording and stuff while you have her? Totally. Is yeah, it? so we can only really do stuff when she's asleep. Okay. Um. Yeah, so that's a little bit tricky. So late night but, hours. Yeah, or she does still take a nap in the afternoon, so we can still get a little bit done in the daytime, but yeah. It's, it's got to be like quiet recording if it's during nap time, though. <laughs> yeah, during nap time, you're always like, how long do I really have? Like, is she going to wake up in five minutes or in an hour so there's always that like you can't like really get into like the flow state because you you know like you're about to get interrupted and you have no idea like when it's gonna be is your studio uh, soundproofed um not exactly like we've got like some soundproofing um in like the ceiling but it's not terribly soundproofed no and we've got like hardwood floors like it's an old house so you can hear people walking around above you and so when you recorded heirloom was it done in your studio or was it done somewhere else it was yeah it was done here and you do all the mixing editing everything my husband does all that so he's my producer engineer he also arranged the album and played bass and synths and a lot of hand percussion and stuff and it was all done in this space we originally thought it was going to be like a really digital album that would just have like a lot of digital instruments and you know, heavily relying on synthesizers because we were in an apartment building when we started making the record and uh, had very thin walls and lots of noisy neighbors. So doing, you know, live instruments just wasn't an option. And then uh, we ended up moving. Luckily, we were able to get a house, even though the market is like bananas in Windsor right now. Yeah, yeah, it's out of control. And uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, we just managed to get in like super lucky. And uh, anyway, and then everything changed and the album became like an opportunity for us to record all of our friends who play locally in jazz bands and stuff. So it, it's basically all live musicians. There are very few digital elements on it now. And it was all done in our very humble, modest, unfinished basement. That's awesome. How long did it take you? Once we really got to work on it, I think I would say like maybe six months. But even then, that wasn't like, you know, that's working around 
having a toddler in the house because this was last year before the pandemic, of course. And uh, I would still have to take her out of the house so that she wouldn't be, you know, picked up in any of the microphones. So it, it did take a little longer than it might have otherwise. Um, but it took us many, many, many years to get it going. Like I, my, my album before that came out in 2014. So I went, yeah, six years without putting out a record. So that was like really overdue. Was, there, get done. was there like a reason for that? Was it just the baby or? It was, it was that we were in the apartment really. Like that was a big problem. And uh, at that point in time too, we weren't really able to produce ourselves. Like it's really only been the last couple of years that my husband's been able to like acquire the skills and the gear and now the space to do our recording at home. So previously we used to always have to go out to other studios and that meant you'd had to get a grant um, to have a budget to pay all of the people involved in doing that. So so that really was a, a big roadblock. And I had applied um, especially a lot to Factor. And I originally had had a lot of luck with Factor. It's kind of becoming a more controversial granting institution these days um, because it is really difficult to get funding. Um, but I did have luck with them back making my 2014 album, Little Sway. And then, you know, you put in a grant application, you wait many, many, many months, and then you get rejected and you try again. And like, that all just takes so, so long. So a lot of why it took so long to make that record was just waiting on grants that just, you know, were rejected over and over. Did you have to like narrow down a bunch of songs or I'm sure you must have like at least a hundred songs already written like in your head or something. So how do you pick which ones make the album? Um, um, mostly just based on playing them live and which ones got the best reactions, I'd say. Um, you know, over time, like you you can kind of tell if like you just don't feel it sometimes with the song. You're like, oh, there's something about this that's not really representative of what I'm trying to do. So you kind of cast those songs aside or you only dig them up if like you really need like extra material for a super long gig or something. So I don't think I really had too much difficulty narrowing down the songs on either of my two records that are out now because I've never been like a super, super prolific writer. Like I've never written like heaps and heaps and heaps of songs. Um, although I am kind of working on a new project of my custom love songs and I do have 70 of those. So that was uh, a big process to try and narrow those down into 70? You know, 10. Yeah, that's... yeah, 70. Okay, oh God, so yeah. so we like when we were doing research for the show, we saw this that you were doing this. Um, what do you mean seventy? You've had seventy people contact you to write a song catered for them. Yeah, yeah. I started doing it in 2016 as like a Valentine's Day thing that I thought I would only do once, and it just ended up doing so well that I've continued to do it ever since. That's so I have like a part crazy. of my website, and Google is really good to me that like when people are looking for custom songs, like I'm one of the things that comes up. So I, it continues to get hits even though I'm not really like actively promoting it all that hard which right is really crazy that's awesome yeah. what, what made you think of that like how'd you start that that whole project um a friend of mine uh, a singer songwriter from PEI Megan Blanchard she was doing something similar for Valentine's Day where she would record um just like a cover of a classic love song but she would do a unique performance every time and then it would be a Valentine for you to give to someone so um I liked that idea but at that point in time I thought you know, I, I wanted to like make it a bigger price tag because I needed more money. It was either that or get a day job. So I was like, maybe I can try and use this as an opportunity to get better at songwriting. Because at that point, I had written very, very little in the years prior. And uh, it really tapped into my need to write. And I realized that I had a lot of musical ideas that I hadn't been using at all. And yeah, so I thought, why not push myself and try something you know, that's a bit more involved and maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't work. I kind of thought like no one was going to take me up on it. Like maybe like just one of my friends would throw me a bone and that'd be it. But uh, it ended up really taking off partly because at that time, you know, I wasn't charging very much at all for it. It was like a hundred bucks for a completely original written recorded song. So, so yeah, it did well. So what do they do? Like they, they email or text or whatever, and they give you like an idea of what they want to have in the song. And then you just kind of create the lyrics around it. Um, I actually, from the get go, I started a, a questionnaire. So I get people to fill out, you know, a couple questions about how they met this person and like any special memories they share. Um, I try and prompt them to kind of think deeply about that person and their relationship and to try and hone in on like, you know, what are going to be the most poetic aspects of their story? Or are there any meaningful phrases in their relationship that I could kind of riff around? And uh, and then I take everything that they have said, and that becomes the basis of the lyrics. So I try to add very, very little. I don't want to, you know, extrapolate or guess. Like, I'll, sometimes I'll write back to them if I have like follow-up questions, just so that it's like as true to their story as possible. And what does it normally yeah. take you to like, to, from start to finish? Um, If, like just for the songwriting, usually like, probably about two hours, I would say. Um, and then the recording, it kind of depends on if they just want like an intimate guitar vocal performance or if they want like a more fully produced thing. 
Um, so I would say recording probably takes anywhere from like one and a half to like four or five hours. Do you That's do like different bad. guitar riffs and like chords and everything for each song? Yeah, every song I try and make it original. Like I don't have like a template that I follow or anything. I mean, invariably, once you've done 70 of them, there are some that probably are more similar. Right. But I, I have not yet <laughs> done anything like... You haven't had to repeat. Yeah, no. I haven't like made like, here are my five different templates that I could <laughs> just... No one would know, I guess. But to me, like the, the challenge is like trying to do something new. But at the same time, it has to be what they are expecting. It can't be like super out there like it's not really my outlet for expressing myself creatively because they're expecting something that says something in a way that's going to be meaningful and i think that if it's too creative it'll take them out of that like it'll distract them from the message of the song so gus yeah. i'm gonna get one written about you from me you're gonna get a love song yeah yeah uh-huh. or me i think that i think that would be good <laughs> i'd like to hear that yeah <laughs> we'll do it for christmas time that project uh-huh. led led you to do a ted talk as well eh? it did yeah well i kind of i kind of was opportunistic in how i got that ted talk i was originally just supposed to perform at the TEDx event and um, and they told me that I had to pick songs that were original because I had to have the rights to them because they were going to film it and they're going to put it online and I was like well if you're going to film it and put it online I should just like do part songs and part TED talk and you know I can talk about how I do these custom love songs and they were like yeah that's a really great idea let's do it so that's how that kind of came into being it was just supposed to be a performance but I managed to spin it into something more they, like so they travel here like, I don't, I don't know anything about TED Talks, how they work. Yeah, so I, I'm not sure exactly how they come into being, but it, I think it's usually like that a region will, it's like it's like a franchise, I guess. So I was going to say they have like a, the regular TED space and like the TED events and the locally sponsored TEDx's throughout, That's it. throughout the world. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. Yours, yours was a TEDx. Yes, it was okay. a TEDx. Yeah. <laughs> did, you did, did you have to memorize yours? I did. Yeah. Um, I think it generally goes the best if you do. I mean, I was lucky that I didn't have a child at that point in time. So I would just practice my TED talk like five times a day, like every day for like several weeks leading up to it. And I'm so glad I did that because I'm really, really happy with how it turned out. Cause like, I'm not good at public speaking. Like I've never been good at it. Yeah. Um, so I, I, I still look at that and I'm like, wow. How long did I, you have to talk for? It was about 15 minutes or maybe I think it went up to 17 or 18 minutes, but that does include the songs as well. So holy cow. Jeez. Yeah, it was a little while. Yeah, man. I can't even. But no, I had I had listened to a podcast about how people get ready for like the TED talks, like the official ones and how you have to have everything like written out and submitted and approved of beforehand. And you have to be able to recite it while doing something like totally different, like word for word while you're completely distracted. Like that's kind of the bar. So I was like, I'm just going to try and do that for this. Holy cow. I can barely remember our intro and I've said that thing like 40 times. I like Yeah, I don't I don't I'm not good at it. Like I don't know how I did it. Like it was just like I like really rallied that one day and probably never will have to do that again, thank God. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't think we're doing any TED Talks anytime soon there, guys. Oh, you never know. Um, I mean, my uh, my incredible public speaking skills. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh. That is yeah. That could not be more accurate if uh, if you tried, guys. <laughs> So in the uh, in the intro, though, I mentioned you're doing that live charity event for Ronald McDonald House. So what brought that on? Um, um, a friend of mine is involved in organizing the event, and he just thought it'd be a nice idea to have um, a live at home concert as an experience that people can share with other households so they can all be watching the show remotely. And I have been doing live streams throughout the pandemic. So, um, and they've all just been free on Facebook. So this is the first time that I've ever done one that has been like exclusive, like behind a paywall. And uh, so it was a really good charity and like a good, you know, good thing to do around the holidays. Did you pick the charity or did they? They did. They did pick it. So they have a reason as to why they pick one. Cause like for him and I, it's, you know, pretty important to both of our families that charity we support that one too we do a lot of work with them um so it just it kind of caught us off guard like holy cow you know i don't wonder if she picked it or somebody else picked it. yeah yeah that's good so what are you doing is it a full set uh it'll be an hour-long performance of just you in this space yep um well when we do them my husband is producing so he'll talk to me in between the songs and he'll sing harmonies and you know he reads me the comments because i can't see them because we just use our iphones for all of our live streams because they're the best cameras that we currently have that we're able to connect to our computer and our soundboard um they're great so yeah cameras, he'll be in the though. studio with me they are really great yeah. i know at some point i feel like we should like i we would have to update our entire computer to like really go to the next level with the video quality of it so we haven't quite gone there yet we're still getting by with the iphone yeah, I, I can tell you from experience that video is the biggest headache that i've got 
<laughs> it's a, there's a huge, yeah. huge learning curve with it and trying to figure oh out. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. And we've like really felt the pressure to do that during the pandemic because there's so much call for like, you know, pre recorded virtual concerts and live streams. And like everyone wants you to contribute something that you've done at home. So we've done so much video this year. It's insane. Like I'm really glad that we had like a basic camera and just have been really resourceful with figuring out how to make some videos look okay. Yeah. So now that your album's out, are you going to try to do a tour next year if you can or what's what's the plan for promoting that one and going forward uh, I feel like the pandemic has just made it like really hard to figure out how to proceed with promoting that album um and the, now that I'm already working on other projects it kind of like I don't know that I'll ever tour like that record specifically um we really do want to go out east because that's where I'm from and uh and my family lives out there and it works out really well that we could you know either have them come along with us and kind of take care of our toddler while we're performing or she can go and stay with her grandparents for a little while and we can just tour like we haven't done any kind of travel really um since she was born or any kind of gigging it's been really uh, a challenge like I guess I, I did go up to Toronto for a gig at one point like last November and every now and then we're able to make something work but it's definitely a lot more complicated when you've got childcare to try and juggle while you're on the road so now that she's a bit older, um, I do think it's going to be a lot more feasible for us to consider doing like even just some small like weekend tours like we really, really want to do that. Um, but it was hard when she was like a year old and like would not go to bed for anyone else. And like you just know that she's going to be like complete hell for her babysitters <laughs> and they're going to have a really bad time and they're not going to want to do it again. And But now it's she loves our, her grandparents so we're good well as soon as this pandemic is done with like we're gonna we're gonna travel for sure and, and they you said they still live out east so is it uh nova scotia that they live yeah my parents live in nova scotia but mike's parents are here in windsor so that that's good we've got some child minding options here as well as out east so kind of flexible to do some touring around this part of the country or around yeah. that part of the country as well when yeah. did you move here to windsor 10 years ago now oh, okay and what yeah. what was the the reason like what was the motive uh there were a couple of reasons uh i always thought i was going to move to ontario because that's kind of just like the natural progression of things when you're a musician on the east coast i mean like the east coast is amazing like i love it i miss it i would have been a totally different artist if i had have stayed out there um and I, I don't know i just like i always felt like someone someday some guy was gonna like import me to Ontario and like it happened I fell in love with my husband and I uh I went back to Halifax just for like six or eight months to like make enough money that I could move here for good so so he lived here yeah. already yeah yeah he's he's been you know born and raised in Windsor but he used to go out on tour all the time to the east coast so that's how I met him was when he was on the road traveling with a band called Mishu and uh, I would I would open their shows and my roommate actually was a booking agent. So he would sometimes book their shows and then they would crash at my house and let my indoor cat out. <laughs> Shenanigans. Oh, no. <laughs> yeah, I moved here on the train, actually. The Via Rail has an no. onboard entertainment program. Yeah, I played my way here. They cover your um, your travel if you're performing. Plus, they gave me like one train for free. So I got all the way to Toronto for free. And then I just had to pay for the last leg, which really isn't bad at all. No. And yeah, my cats came with me. That's they gave amazing. me a cabin and meals. And it was really, I was like, these people don't know that I'm not a big deal. So what do you mean? So wherever the train stops, there's a cabin that they give you? Or you have like um, a no, cabin on the train? No, that's it. Yeah. Oh, you okay. can do this program on any of the trains that have like the sleeper touring class where they have like the cabins on board. Those are the trains that you can play on. So yeah, there's one or two on the east coast and i have no idea how many are on the west coast probably a lot but uh so did yeah. you perform on the train on the way or like did you yeah. like, like you were part yeah of i played on the train they and it's only just for those people who also have cabins so it's not like you're playing for everybody on the train which is unfortunate because that would be super cool um but they i don't i just don't know how they would do that you'd have to just be like walking up and down the aisles with an acoustic guitar <laughs> or something maybe like they had a um a car on the back of the train um it's kind of like the viewing car where it has like a 360 view up it's like a two floor car and so anyway they had like a little coffee section back there so you could make yourself a coffee or a tea and then they would just have yeah the musician just plays like acoustic no sound system or anything and it's just like a really intimate one-on-one -on -one. like you can chat with the people and yeah a really Damn. cool way to Very to cool. move across the country yeah. i think i've been on a train like maybe twice in my life really and, and the train's I, awesome i, I love know. it that's a good yeah. way to go yeah i don't know oh yeah it's especially like okay like if you're trying to get to toronto or something the 401 is not a pretty ride no. you know but to be on the train like it's beautiful like it just goes through like woods and you pass by all these like 
like uh, like beautiful little ponds and streams and things and like it's a totally different experience so i have to ask you who is this soul brother mike that's my husband it is yeah okay we had no idea we were debating this back and forth because we oh, see him, we see him in some of your videos and stuff, and we have no idea who he is. Yeah, yeah, he's my husband. So we've been together ten years and change because we technically got together before I moved here. And yeah. he does all your yeah. producing and he does these days. Yeah, some of my earlier work's been done by other people locally, um, but uh, but he's now my go-to producer. And then you did um, you did some video work with Gavin Michael Booth too. Mm -hmm. What was that like working with that guy? Awesome. Yeah. He's got such great ideas and he's such a hard worker. I, I like I have always had the best time on shoots with him because I just feel like his ideas are so much fun to do. And he always just surrounds himself with like really great and helpful people. So I just feel like I'm kind of getting pampered all day. <laughs> it's really, yeah. really nice. So yeah. you worked with him before you went to L.A. then? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think I did one video with him while he was uh, in town over the holidays after he moved and yeah, but that was that was a couple of years back now. So I think he's done two videos for me. Yeah, two. So now is this like you don't work at all? You're just now you're doing uh, like singing, songwriting. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Full no, time. I. Uh, yeah, I. Uh, I worked full time from the time I was 18 until I was about 24, and then I finally reached a point where it was like I was getting offered gigs that were lucrative enough that it didn't make sense to like work all week and then make all my money like one day on the weekend. So I uh, switched over to being a full time performer towards the end of 2014. And, you know, I've always had the attitude that like I can go out and get a day job if I'm desperate. Like I'm like just committed to like making my life work. Like I'm not going to, you know, bankrupt myself if it's not working out musically. But uh, I've just been really lucky that like even through the pandemic that I've managed to be OK is really like surprising to me. Yeah. Oh, it's good yeah. for a lot because not a lot of people. Yeah. I think honestly, it's because of the custom songwriting thing, like because p that has continued to reach people and like, that's just a really great source of income for me. So is it picking up now for holidays, lot. like for Christmas? Gifts? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. This is a busy time of year for sure. It's hard. Like I used to do Valentine's Day, but um, I feel like people don't have that big of a budget in mind for Valentine's Day. Like, you know, wine and chocolate's yeah. good. Like you don't need to go crazy on Valentine's Day. So now that like my prices have gone up over the years, there's very few people who are like willing to, you know, make that big of a gesture for Valentine's Day. But Christmas is like, yeah, people want to go all out at Christmas. Do you do mm -hmm. like uh, just the love song or, or is it like tailored to the season? Like do you do a Christmas based love song or? Mm -hmm. I haven't really done one. There was only one song that ever had any kind of element of Christmas and it was because their love story had taken place around Christmas. So I kind of like worked a little bit of that imagery into the song. But no, I really just stick to like the love song. Every now and then someone will reach out, ask if I would be willing to write a song on a particular topic. And I usually do shy away from that because I feel like I need to really know the subject in order to speak about it. And I feel like love is something universal enough that it's easy to talk about. But once it gets too specific, uh, it, it, I kind of get lost. So do you, you write the song, then you retain the, the rights to that song? Yeah. Okay. So they get a custom like tailored for them, but you still own the, like the master. Yeah. Yep. Well, I mean, they're, they're free to do it. Like, you know, not whatever they want with their version of it, but like to share it privately amongst their friends and like some people will put them online and like, but and yeah, no, I do, I do keep all the rights to them. I mean, that's mostly just so that I have the ability to perform them live whenever I want. And then I could, you know, um, re-record them and put them on albums. Like my most recent record has two custom love songs on it. So it's really tricky to um, release material when you don't have the rights to it. So that was just like an easy way for me to. Right. Yeah. Or even to like, yeah, to do anything with. So what is, uh, what's the, the instrument list that you can play? Oh, um, basically it's short. It's really just like guitar and flute. Really? I, I play the flute, but I'm not that good at the flute. Like I'm good at like background flute. I would never do like a solo or like any of that fun riffy lead type stuff. That's See, not, that's you, not in my skill set. You're going to need to try, get out of that comfort zone and go out and do a flute solo. Maybe someday. I mean, I have always loved playing the flute, but I just like, I don't know. I feel like I kind of hit a plateau with it and I just don't have like a nice tone. Like I feel like I just need some lessons or something. So it's doable. Maybe someday I'll get really great at the flute and I'll be like really bold about it. But and what about right Mike? now I kind of, I bury it. Um, Mike is mostly guitar and bass. Um, you know, he can get by on piano, but I don't, he hasn't really gigged with the piano very much. It's mostly just guitar and bass. And he was learning trumpet for a while. 
But oh, yeah? uh, that's kind of just like a fun hobby kind of thing on the side. It's really hard to get good at a whole new instrument, you know? Yeah. The 10,000 hours thing like really applies. Yeah. When that's did you wild. when did you start doing all this like full time taking it seriously and kind of just pushing it's forward? Back in, back in 2014. But I mean, I've been writing songs since I was like a teenager. So your first record is when you really like kicked it into, into high gear and just went full out um well i have a first record that i swept under the rugs so oh really not a lot of people know about it yeah i put out a record back in 2010 but um back then it, i was much more of like a folk artist and my voice sounded so much younger that it totally sounds like a different artist be with my voice being so different and the style being so different so that's like not available anywhere on like all the streaming platforms because i was just like it feels disingenuous to have this as part of my my discography because i'll never play these songs and i don't sound like that anymore so but yeah that was my first record it was recorded in, it's called darling darling and it was recorded in chicago at a really great studio where like wilco and bright eyes have recorded and uh, yeah that was like a really big way to start my professional recording career when i was 21 years old and prior to that i'd just been doing stuff like in my bathroom and just at home really basic so stuff you, that i would just put on my myspace you went to chicago to record that mm -hmm. yeah i was able to to get a grant um, from the province of Nova Scotia. Uh, it was actually something I had to write because I was taking a music business program at the community college. And instead of exams, they had us write grants. And then they would bring people in from the local music industry to judge those grants in front of us. And, uh, you know, they gave us like extra feedback and helped us improve our applications. And then after when I finished my schooling, I like just submitted the grant application I'd written and it got funded. And so that was how I got the budget to do my first album. That's awesome. My college career paid for itself. <laughs> Holy cow. What what music do you listen to? We know a lot of bands. We know a lot of musicians. And they, they play one genre, but listen to something that is completely different from what they play. So what's hmm. kind of on your playlist? Um, I always have to think about our vinyl records because I feel like that's where... Oh, but then again, I do have Spotify too. Um, I... I'm listening to so much Raffi lately. That's like the first thing that came to mind. <laughs> Raffi Christmas. Do they have that in the States? Um, they don't have Raffi in the States, do they? I do. Well, I could see maybe why they wouldn't. He's really like anti-commercial type stuff. Oh, really? Because I yeah, know there's Canadian like, ones. They... Never. Who's the the, Sorry, the speckled frogs guy? Is that Raffi? I think so. I mean, he does that song. I don't know who else does, yeah, yeah. but okay. definitely he does. Yeah. So you're listening to Raffi right now. I'm listening to Raffi. No. Okay. Okay. <laughs> serious. Serious now. Um, I listen to like a lot of jazz music. Um, Billie Holiday, um, the saxophonist Stan Getz. I really love the saxophonist uh, Lester Young as well is amazing. Um, a lot of like those female crooners like Sarah Vaughn and Dinah Washington. Um, more contemporary stuff that I like. Um, I've been listening to so many artists who are just like friends of mine, like Madeline Dornart and Dane Roberts and the Bishop Boys, like just a bunch of like local bands we listen to a lot because they're all on the label that my husband and I co-run. Um, What's What label is that? It's called Soul City Music Co-op. And we founded it just uh, January the 1st of this year. Really? So it's just like us and a couple other acts that we collaborate with. And yeah. Holy cow. Okay. So we have a lot of questions about this. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> Yay. Jesus. Okay. So wait, so you started your own record label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You... It's very untraditional because we don't take any percentage of any of our artists profits. We don't own anything that they do. Um, it's more about like cross collaboration and skill sharing and mentorship and cost sharing and kind of using like whatever skills that we've acquired and helping promote the other acts. Like, cause I kind of have like more of a marketing acumen than a lot of the artists that we know locally. So I just kind of help them with like press releases and sending things out to campus radio and all that kind of Holy cow. stuff. So what, what kind of artists do you have on there? So like I said, we got Madeline Dordart and, and, Dane Roberts and the Bishop Boys. Our newest artist is Ayola. He's um, from Nigeria, but he's been in Windsor the last couple of years now, and he just put out his first EP last month. Um, of course, Soul Brother Mike is on it. Um, Mike also fronts a band called The Family Soul, and they're on it too. And then uh, we also have Brennan Scott Friel. So a lot more of uh, the artists are a lot more like folk kind of, you know, Canadiana sound. Right. But then there's also kind of like more soulful stuff as well. Yeah. So are you are you, like, can you take anybody or are you very selective in who? We are selective on? because we do a lot of work for the artists. Or we try to like, you know, we try to like we, we have a website that 
we'll create like a, we help them create their own websites basically and their own like merch stores. And we do all the marketing and promo and like Mike will help a lot with like mixing their projects and kind of helping like get them ready to be distributed. And it's just like we, it, it can be quite a lot of work sometimes. I mean, it's work that we really enjoy doing. And to us, it's like, if we're going to do, you know, sometimes people will ask you like, if you want to do a gig for charity or something. And to us, it's kind of like, our this is sort of like our form of charity is just like helping other artists and teaching them how to do more of these kind of self-management style aspects of their careers so that they can be more um, like financially sustainable and so that they can do it full time as well sort of thing. Do they record in your studio or in their own? Pretty much all of our artists have the ability to record themselves or they already have like people locally that they've been working with. So they kind of, they take care of that aspect of things themselves. And then we'll just sort of help if they need like mixing and mastering, like Mike will help with that sort of thing. Man, oh man. I. <laughs> we keep busy. <laughs> like when we were younger, that was always the dream, right? Is to find somebody with a label or in, somebody in the industry. That's and the try thing, to get... right? You're always like waiting around for someone to like sign you. And the thing is like, we're not like that kind of a label. Like we're, it's like, this is the kind of label that like anyone could really make. And to me, like, it's just sort of like a, like a more official version of just like a circle of friends, basically. I feel like in every city, there's so many little pockets of musicians that work together and they play on each other's projects and they engineer each other's recordings. And But they don't like really, there's nothing to really unify them. It's like, if you know them, you know that they're all interconnected, but there's not like, you know, a stamp on their packaging saying like, we're part of this group. Like, if you like us, check out these other people. So that's kind of like a big aspect of, of starting this label. Like we just wanted to like have this grassroots kind of thing that's like really like not a, corporate commercial driven thing it's just about like uniting songwriters and trying to like empower them and helping just further their careers and give them better tools here we go middle of the show we're gonna do another one of the grapefruit vodka chrissy what do you got got my red wine red still. wine here we go so okay. so everybody listening guys girls all the dudes here we go cheers 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 when you uh when you like finish, I don't know, work day, you're, you're done singing for the day, you put your guitar down, you go upstairs and you grab something to drink. What are you normally grabbing? Red wine? Probably red wine or a gin and tonic or some kind of gin and soda kind of concoction. My husband actually is really, he was really into making um, cocktails for a while, mostly like old fashions. We have so many bitters in our pantry. It's absurd. I think the only time I've ever had an old fashioned was at Blind Owl. Oh, I love Blind Owl. Yeah. I went there one time. And the, the dude behind the counter, he's like, or the bar or whatever, he's like, um, I asked him, I said, you know, a lot of my buddies talk about this old fashioned. He's like, you've never had one. He's like, I'll make you one right now. And he made it and it was delicious. It was unreal. It is pretty classic. Yeah. yeah. I've never had it till like maybe, yeah. uh, maybe a year ago, I think was the first one. You generally try and stay away from whiskey though. Yeah. So my thing is like, I can do clear liquor, um, dark liquor. I just can't do. I don't know what it is, the taste or something, or, or I don't know. It makes me like kind of gag every time I drink it. So Fair enough. Everyone has that one thing they can't do. For me, it's white wine. It's like the first thing that I ever got drunk on, and I just like can't. Even though it was like a billion years ago, I just can't. Yeah. But it's, you had too much. That's the problem. It's too sweet, yeah. though. Is it? I don't know. I don't know. I find it, it just, too sweet. It doesn't matter. Yeah. I can't find a single white wine that doesn't just, ugh. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> if it's wine, it's got to be red. But what about... Um, let's say you're like you're working outside or something or you're i don't know you've been gardening all day and you're sweaty and you want to grab something beer. cold beer and what's it's what's beer. the go to your go to beer i don't know i think my favorite's like slim and honey brown that's a good one uh, that's a good one yeah, i so love it yeah so no no guinness no it's <laughs> too rich too dark for me i can't do it all right fine. it's just i mean you know what like even those circumstances being outside and in, in the summertime I don't understand how you can go for a Guinness. Like that's just the wrong drink. Because it's not hot. It's not like I drink warm beer. It's, it's still, cold beer. I don't know. It's just like it's like it's a porter. Like it's or a stout. It's a stout. It's it's made to like get you through forty days of Lent. Like <laughs> it's, it's a, oh man. It's, it's not to cool you off in the summertime. <laughs> it's not that bad, man. Yeah, I I I would like. I think I could do it if I was like sipping on it. But like I like to kind of drink a beer while it's cold. Do you, uh, do you ever go out? Like, do you go to pubs? Do you go to bars or anything? Um, well, when we did go, it was mostly, um, 
to places where we could get cocktails. Um, we used to go to F&B in Walkerville quite a lot oh, and yeah. also to the Blind Owl. And before that, we used to go to the Foundry. And then, you know, Fog is kind of also our go-to where we would just end up a lot because a lot of our friends would just be playing there all the time. Did you ever do that? Do you ever do the open mic or anything? Uh, yeah, I did the open mic a couple of times. And I used to play there quite a bit. Like that was my go-to for like doing a CD release show kind of thing. Now that they have Meteor, that was the space where I did my album release in February. Because uh, I had like a huge band with me and we just like physically would not have been able to fit on the stage at Fog. Yeah, fair enough. I had like 11 people or something with what? me that night. It was bananas. Yeah. <laughs> like like all playing or just an entourage? Yeah, all playing. Yeah, no, I had two backup singers and three horns and, you know, a big rhythm section. So it was a lot of people. And then, yeah, it was such a shame because we, we spent so much time rehearsing this big band and then pandemic hit. So we were like really looking forward to like, you know, applying to festivals and stuff and like doing a lot of gigs this summer and finally being able to like play bigger stages. And then, yeah, nothing. Jeez. It's like, what was that band? Uh, Brian Setzer Orchestra. You're like that. You're like a little mini orchestra with all these people. Yeah. That's actually the vibe of the record. Like, it's like there's a small orchestra on a lot of these songs. Like, it's a strange sound that I haven't really heard done before where you've got like horns and strings and it's soul and it's also like like moody and just like really different. That's yeah, a... we didn't have we didn't have strings at that show. It was the one thing I wish we could have had. But what do you mean? Like a cello like or too violin? many people. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, we had a cello and violin on the record. But we can't physically fit that many people in our basement for a rehearsal. Like, w this room is not that big. Like, someone was in the laundry room and someone's in the workout room. We just had the doors open. It was a challenge. <laughs> you were saying uh, the sound is soulful. That's that's what him and I were we were describing your voice as. Like when we were listening to all your stuff for the show, and uh, and you know watching your videos and stuff. You, you have a very like soulful voice, like a very rich sounding voice. Something we haven't Thank heard you. in a long, long time. And that's that's what prompted oh, us to, cool. to reach out to you to have you on the show. Was oh, that's so cool. we were like, holy cow! Like this girl is unreal. Like super talented. Aww. Super talented. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. Thanks. I feel like my voice is it's always changing, and like like I like I mentioned, my album I put out back in 2010 sounds like a totally different person. Like my voice has changed so much over the years, and it's mostly because I like to emulate voices. Like uh, I've never told this to anyone before but like I find like even if I just like watch a certain tv show for too long I find myself kind of emulating the voice of like a character that resonates with me and I do the same thing with music too where like I'll, if I just like really take a deep dive on an artist and like like I did that with Billie Holiday and I just you start to find yourself like internalizing their little vocal quirks and things and so I feel like Billie Holiday is where like a lot of my soulfulness come from comes from and I'm also really into like Amy Winehouse and Carol King and like even just like listening to the way that people play saxophone can be so informative as a vocalist yeah it's kind of like a weird place to take vocal inspiration from but just like the really crazy melodic um uh like just improvisational nature that a lot of soloists have is kind of fun to try and take into a voice. It's funny how everybody who plays an instrument hears a different thing in, in a song, right? Like for Gus, mm -hmm. you said you listen to bass lines before. For me, it's drum lines. I'm a drummer. Yeah. I love listening to like the beats. You're talking about mm -hmm. saxophone and vocals and all this stuff. <laughs> and we could all three of us listen to the same song, but all hear something completely different. Yeah. That's what's cool. For sure. Mm -hmm. I love when you have a song like that too, where it's like there's, you have to listen to it multiple times because like each time you can like focus in on a different instrument. Like I love when there's like that extra element of like yeah. interesting parts, you know, yeah. that you can't consume it all in one listen. That's kind of really cool. Yeah. Too, too much uh, dimension to it. Mm -hmm. So what's uh, like when you guys are not doing music, what are you guys watching? Are you watching stuff on TV, Netflix? We watch a lot of baking shows. Um, really? It started as like we were watching Nailed It because it's actually on the kids Netflix. So we were like, we can watch this with our toddler around. And then it like weirdly morphed into a love of like all kinds of baking and cooking shows that are actually like really quite serious and I I love it like I don't know I'm just like learning so much and I feel like now that we're in a pandemic and like we're constantly cooking maybe that's what's making me so interested in it is because so much home cooking is happening right now so I, to have some new ideas is really nice I love Nailed It have you seen that guy? Yeah. I never watched that Dude. one. I did the barbecue one. It's so oh funny. Oh my God. These I people die. are terrible. They are it's absolutely amazing. terrible. It's like a show where they're like bad at So, well, baking. here's the thing. Like they set them up to fail from the start, right? Because they're going to give them this, you got to make this like nine tiered whatever cake. And it's got like all this crazy art, artist like decoration done to it and it's painting and stuff. And these people have never baked. So like you're already doomed to fail. Like they've never baked ever before. Like just well, like- no, they 
they've baked, but they're really, really, really bad at right. it. Like so, they, they like they don't read the recipes. They're like recipes, whatever. Yeah, they're just not like, chefs. Feel like, it. they're just, yeah. It's like me. So It'd like, be like me going on the show. Like Canada's worst driver version of uh, baking. Of baking. Yeah. Yeah. And then, so they, it's very, and they'll give you like two hours to make like yeah. this monstrosity of a beautiful cake that like a pro probably took all day to make. And see, that's what I was gonna say is I want to see like the behind the scenes of the pro making the cake and how long it took them and like mm-hmm. how hard it was because you just show somebody that like that final cake and I swear to. God, I guess you got to watch this man it's I feel like that's like a common thing on all cooking shows though like they never like th- it's an impossible task like they give oh, for you sure you have to cook these 10 items that would take the normal mm-hmm. person like 12 hours and you have 35 minutes <laughs> yeah, yeah there's no way they yeah. made this yeah. stuff in two hours yeah. no friggin' way did you have you seen the Christmas one yet the Christmas nailed it yeah it's great I did that while I was cutting all the lights off my pre-lit Christmas tree that broke what you know those pre-lit Christmas trees? Mine, like, wouldn't light at the top. So I spent a night cutting all the lights off so I could just put my own lights on it. And I just watched, like, Endless nailed it. It was, like, the only thing that was keeping me sane while I was spending hours with the wire cutters. No way. Dangling my Christmas tree. Yeah, it was the comic relief that I desperately needed. So normally when we have artists in studio, we like to do the studio sessions. And given the current state of events, uh, we've had to ask you to do a remote for us. And you were nice enough to, to, to film a, a song. What, uh, what song are we going to hear? So the song I picked for you is called Hungry Love. And it was the first single off of my album, Heirloom. And it's the song for which I had a music video come out last month as well. Nice. All right, nice. So here we go. Let's listen to that. <laughs>
wow, holy cow. Yeah. So this is exactly, that was exactly what we were talking about earlier about the soulful voice. Yeah. Like I don't, I, we haven't heard anything like that in, in years. And watching you, like watching you play, it's like, not only like, do you have so much talent, but like, it looks like you love playing. Like you really enjoy performing. Mm -hmm. How it took me a long time to, to like playing. It used to make me like super crazy nervous, but. I, it, it was like a confidence issue. Like I didn't have confidence when I was younger, but a couple more years on me and now I like really get into it when I play. How do you uh, like, okay, so it's one thing to just like strum chords and, and sing along and stuff, but it's a different thing when you're moving your fingers very intricately, you're doing a different strum pattern and you're also trying to sing with that, that much soul and like, and uh, like emotion behind your voice. How hard is it to do all that at the same time and still sound so good? Um, it's, it, it used to be a lot harder, but now I'm, I feel like I'm getting better at it. Um, yeah, it definitely used to be easier to just like focus on one or the other, especially like, cause I used to just play, um, acoustic guitar and I was just playing like first position chords, like just your basic, like, this is what you, the, you know, G, C, D that you learn when you play guitar. Um, and I, I fell in love with jazz and soul and that's when I started like learning more um, intricate chords and more interesting like voicings and whatnot and really like pushing the boundaries of what I could do on the guitar. And I think a part of that was just because I noticed right away that, you know, there's not that many female guitarists that I would encounter in like the regional communities that I play in. And I always just wanted to like find something that would make me stand out. And so I felt like pushing the boundaries of what I could do on the guitar was like a really good way of doing that. But yeah, it did take a really long time before I was able to do the two things at the same time yeah. and not like really suck at one or the other. Yeah, because for like for me, I've tried it. You know, I can play guitar a little bit, but um, you know, you just try to even talk in the same key or in the same tone as what you're playing, and within four seconds, I I'm completely off. I can't remember what I'm doing, and everything just falls apart very quickly. I feel like that's me when I play piano. Like I just like I I, I really want to learn to play piano, but I can't do it because I just can't like multitask. Like it's that like I don't know. It's a different part of the brain or something. I just can't seem to figure it out. <laughs> I will say that the pandemic has actually made me, I think, a better player because um, because we've been doing live streams. And so everything has been done in like a controlled environment where you can very clearly hear the guitar and the vocal and it's all being recorded. And, you know, we've been keeping them up online so people can rewatch them. So I feel like we're trying really, really hard to make them sound as good as we can. And prior to the pandemic, I was doing so many like restaurant background music style gigs where like people couldn't hear me at all. So if I kind of sucked that night, no one would really notice. So it's more but stressful doing a doing like a live stream. There's more work that goes into it for sure. Like yeah. I want to be like really well practiced because like if I make a mistake, you're going to hear it. Like it's recorded. You can watch it back. Yeah, it's there forever. I yeah. think that's that's yeah. why Gus hates doing live casts. I can't stand it. Yeah. We normally do a but, live cast uh, like every before every show, but he, I don't know. There's some aversion. I don't know what it is though. Well, it's just something I mean, about the red light being on. Like it just yeah. wigs you out, man. I just, I mean, I'm not, I'm not generally, I mean, you probably noticed I'm not like the greatest <laughs> at, uh, I'm socially awkward, I guess is the best way to put it. Like, I'm, I don't know why I started a podcast, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> Me neither. but then when it's live, like on top, like it's one thing when it's edited and you can ch change things. And when it's live, like it's, <laughs> it's out there, like you're done. Yeah. Yeah. So I feel like I was really nervous for the first bunch, but then once I had a bunch of them out there, I was like, no one's going to have the time to watch all of these. So I feel like after I had like a good like 10 live streams out, like a, the pressure kind of started to really drop. Do you do you like over prepare for every uh, every live like the one you're doing on the 18th yeah. on December? Have you already been like over preparing for that one? You know, not that one, but it's more like in the week that it's happening that like I'll make sure like I come down and I practice my set like at least like two or three times beforehand and like kind of know like what my talking points are and and then it helps to having Mike in the room because I feel like that just kind of makes me a lot more relaxed really kind of helps with my pacing oh god yeah like if I I've done a couple um events like I did something at CFTV in Cottom it was like a zoom thing and so I didn't have anyone to talk to that could talk back to me and it was so awkward yeah it's so hard I when just... you don't have anyone to, to banter off of so what was the inspiration <laughs> for this song um well i actually started writing it um as like a it wasn't supposed to be a song it was just supposed to be like a journaling exercise because i was having a lot of anxiety about performing after i'd put out my album little sway um because it was my first foray in, into a more soulful sound and i just felt like the expectations on me were a lot higher both in terms of like my image and like the music was so much more challenging to do and i actually kind of stopped playing shows for a while or i only took shows that were really low pressure background music where like you know no one was really like 
closely listening to what I was doing. And for a while I was like, am I really going to be able to keep making music? Like I, every time I had a gig, I felt like I had the flu all day because I was so nervous that I like couldn't eat anything. And by the time I got to the show, I felt like so weak, I could barely stand. So I had to take some time off and I kind of got into like um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy to try and like get into like, why am I feeling so anxious? And like, is there like a healthier way that I can reframe this in my mind? And I don't know, I just did like a bunch of different, like small lifestyle changes and over time it got better, but yeah, Hungry Love was just like an exploration of like, why do I get on stage? Like, why am I doing these things? Because originally I was motivated by love and I was trying to like, you know, attract a guy. Like the first couple songs I wrote were like payback for a dude that like dropped me. So like once you get into a stable relationship, it was like, okay, I'm not writing about that anymore. Like that's the problem that's solved. Okay. So now I'm not trying to win over that one person in the room. I'm trying to win over everybody in the room. And I was like, holy crap, this is hard. Like, <laughs> how, have, how have I not realized how like terrifying this is until now? Yeah. Like I'd already been playing for like 10 years at that point. So it was really weird to suddenly be afraid to go on stage. And at the same time, have my career kind of be like blowing up in a way where I was like, getting a lot of opportunity yeah so it's, it's, it's crazy how like it starts off as one thing and just morphs into something completely different and now here mm -hmm. it is yeah final mm -hmm. form yeah it's crazy yeah. like the path right yeah either way that was awesome so thanks for doing that uh, thank yeah. you so much yeah, yeah we appreciate it so chrissy thanks for hanging out with us and doing the show is awesome we had a great time we had so much fun hanging out with you but before we go if people want to reach you on socials how do they get a hold of you uh i am on twitter facebook and instagram at chrissy cochran I'm also on youtube pretty easy to find just google chrissy cochran and there i am it is pretty easy but for people listening the correct spelling of your name yes let me spell it okay yes. it's c-r-i-s-s-i -I. it's the same letters as the word crisis you just rearrange the last two oh, and then yeah. cochran I didn't even notice yeah, that. I get, I get auto-corrected a lot. Yeah. I have to be very careful when I send emails that it doesn't say Crisis Cochran. <laughs> <laughs> that should be the name of your next record. <laughs> oh, God. Crisis? What crisis? Gus, if they want to get a hold of us, Two Dudes, how do they do that? Two Dudes and a Mike .com or search us on Instagram or Facebook for Two Dudes and Mike. If you go to our uh, Instagram, go to our uh, the link in our bio, that'll take you anywhere you want to go. All right, here we go. <laughs> so we're going to do these final shots here of the night. What are we drinking? Grapefruit vodka. Grapefruit. We got grapefruit vodka. So Chrissy, what do you have? Some red wine? Red there wine. we go. All right. So everybody listening, all the dudes, guys, girls, everybody. Here we go. Cheers. 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 Cheers.